You deserve to know if COVID came from a lab. Your lives have been upended for almost two years because of this virus. We all deserve to know where it came from. Today, we have explosive new evidence that it came from a lab. Come on, let's go take a look at it. Hello everyone, Dr. Chris Martinson here, and I've got an exclusive for you, and we are talking today about a release, a leak that came through the Drastic Organization. We'll be telling you who they are, and we'll be going through the evidence. This is evidence that shows the high preponderance of evidence now leans heavily towards COVID coming from a lab, and U.S. involvement, and a cover-up around that. We all deserve to know the answer to this, so we're going to find out today, and we're going to start here. First, we came across this just yesterday. This is an explosive document leak to a group called Drastic. I'll tell you who they are in just a second. So this is a PDF that they put out. Here is the link for it down here, and I'll get my drawing tool out so we can discuss this. This is about a project that came through DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, and that's the uh, high-end uh, investigative arm of the U.S. Uh, military that looks into advanced technologies across a wide range of subjects. They had put forward funding requests for something called Project Defuse, which was about surveillance and um, managing things around bioterrorism, um, biosecurity risks, things like that. How, uh, what happened, and here's the whole number for this whole, uh, 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 the uh, request for proposal went across that number right there. This is written by the drastic people, their context and summary. They said, these leaked documents describing bat research proposed by Eco Health Alliance, who we've talked about before, should be considered in light of the following context. Here is the link to this document itself. Now, before we go in there, I'm going to tell you what the bombshell is. Here's the bombshell in this report that they put out. It's about the insertion of furin cleavage sites into... Uh, coronaviruses to enhance their pathogenicity. The very thing we told you about happening back in May of 2020, the thing we were most concerned about, the genetic sequence that we thought was the smoking gun pointing to lab. Here's what uh, was in this, and we'll get to what this means. First, I'll tell you what it is, then we'll decode it. Uh, they had uh, all these different bullet points in there. Bullet point 16 was the proposal includes the introduction of human-specific cleavage sites. The human specific, uh, protease specific site insertion was proposed, and the proposal does not specify exactly which protease, but does discuss furin in the preceding text. And here's what they said in their proposal from the EcoHealth Alliance to DARPA. They said, we, EcoHealth, will analyze all SARS-CoV um, S gene sequences, that's the spike protein sequences, for appropriately conserved proteolytic cleavage sites in S2, the uh, protein subunit S2, and for the presence of potential furin cleavage sites. Why would they do that? Um, well, uh, because uh, that helps it become a lot more infectious and pathogenic. So they proposed to do it. They said they were going to do it. This is in 2018. First, who is this drastic group and can we trust them? Newsweek did a really nice um, summary on them back here in uh, June of 21. And I like the title, exclusive, How Amateur Sleuths Broke the Wuhan Lab Story and Embarrassed the Media. And boy, did they. I was following these people early on. This is the group that I got a lot of my early information from about the lab leak hypothesis. And uh, Newsweek wrote here, the people responsible for uncovering this evidence are not journalists. Ooh, I, is, that, is that a strike or a, a positive? Um, spies or scientists. They are a group of amateur sleuths with, new res with few resources except for curiosity and a willingness to spend days combing the internet for clues. And, and they don't have any conflicts of interest like, oh, all of their funding comes from the place they're investigating or anything like that. Throughout the pandemic, about two dozen or so correspondents, many anonymous, working independently from many different countries, have uncovered obscure documents, pieced together the information and explained it all in long threads on Twitter. In a kind of open source collective brainstorming session that was part forensic, science, uh, part forensic science, part citizen journalism, and entirely new. They call themselves drastic for decentralized, radical, autonomous search team investigating COVID-19. Drastic. So that's who they are. <clears throat> and what was interesting further in this article, I thought they, they did a good job in this article. Uh, Rowan did a great job. 
uh, putting this article together. Remember, this is back from June. We're talking about information that was just leaked out here in September. So this article is old now. Hopefully it gets updated. Thanks to Drastic, we now know that the Wuhan Institute of Virology had an extensive collection of coronaviruses gathered over many years of foraging in the bat caves, and that many of them, including the closest known relative to the pandemic virus, SARS-CoV-2, came from a mine shaft where three men died from a suspected SARS-like disease in 2012. We know that the WIV was actively working with these viruses using inadequate safety protocols in many cases, no better than a dentist's office would have, in ways that could have triggered the pandemic and that the lab and Chinese authorities have gone to great lengths to conceal these activities. We know that the first cases appeared weeks before the outbreak at the Hunan wet market that was once thought to be ground zero. To this day, you can still hear people talk about the wet market. That's your clue to know that they don't know what they're talking about at all. The wet market has been completely removed from the evidence chain as a place where this might have originated. Cool idea, right? People eating animals, people coming together close to animals, maybe that's where it came from. Eh, didn't come from there. So that's been removed, but still people are, um, some people are clinging to that as an idea. So that's who Drastic is, bunch of amateur sleuths, and they call them amateurs, but many of these people have very deep degrees and a lot of experience, and they're really uh, incredible at what they do, which is... Um, uncovering stuff before the mainstream media was ready to uncover it by a long shot. So they really did embarrass the media because the media should have, could have, would have been doing this sort of stuff, but the media was very interested in not following this idea. Remember, for the first year of the lab leak hypothesis myself, these people were called all sorts of things, conspiracy theorists, um, denigrated as not having the appropriate authority or credentials to speak about these things. But it turns out they've been entirely uh, on the ball and more accurate than the media in every respect. So EcoHealth Alliance, we've talked about them before, but in case you're new to this show, who is EcoHealth Alliance? Well, it's a, it's, it sounds good. It's a, it's a non-governmental organization. Look at the uh, URL at the bottom down there, ecohealthalliance.org. .org. .orgs are, um, you know, very uh, helpful sort of places, right? And they say right on their homepage, they say, who stands between you and the next pandemic? Uh, this would be the... Uh, head of the whole thing, Peter Dayzak, um, here, and he is clinking wine glasses with, oh, well, that would be uh, a.k.a. the bat lady down here, Sheng Ling Ji, and um, some other person I don't recognize. So this is the person, Peter Dayzak, who is at the head and heart of this proposal that we're going to be talking about today. So the EcoHealth Alliance submitted a proposal. And by the way, there's a lot of people besides Peter who work at uh, EcoHealth Alliance. Some of those names will come out today. But EcoHealth Alliance, under Peter's tutelage, submitted a very large proposal for about $14 million to DARPA saying, hey, we would like to do some things and study this bat, these bat viruses, the coronaviruses, more closely. So let's look there. Opening statement from Drastic. They say, on August 27, 2021, the U.S. intelligence community issued a 502-word summary of the conclusions drawn up by the joint investigation ordered by President Biden in late May, and that was a joint investigation into the potential origins of the COVID virus, conspicuously absent from the brief statement were any indications that the evidence presented in testimony to Congress had been part of the intelligence community analysis. Whoops, big oversight. At least not in the unclassified version that was released. The lifting of the gain-of-function moratorium in late 2017 via the Potential Pandemic Pathogen, PPP, three Ps, Potential Pandemic Pathogen Care and Oversight Framework, known as the P3CO, has allowed gain-of-function research with SARS-like coronaviruses to resume with very few practical limits. In particular, the absence of clear definitions of gain-of-function. We've seen recently Fauci in front of Senate testimony saying, I don't think that was gain-of-function. Yes, we have a different definition. No, gain-of-function should be really simple. We took a virus that didn't have any functions and we gave it some. It gained functions. It gained the ability to bind to human receptors. It gained the ability to enter human cells. It gained the ability to transmit from cell to cell. It gained the ability to become airborne. It gained the ability to become more deadly. That's what gain of function means. Very simple. Not hard to understand, but suddenly there's a lot of confusion <laughs> around Fauci as to what we all mean by that. Uh, there really isn't. Creative interpretations of the guidelines and rather discretionary decisions to refer research projects or not. 
all contributed to reducing the effectiveness of the P3CO framework, despite the fact that other agencies of the U.S. federal government actively maintained those GOF gain-of-function standards. Just a few organizations were playing fast and loose. Who were those organizations? Well, that would be the NIAID, headed up by Fauci. That would be the NIH. Um, but DARPA was playing ball and um, not interested in uh, contributing to a pandemic outbreak, apparently. So DARPA responded. Uh, this is one of the drastic uh, community members, this person, the seeker. Here's DARPA's re uh, reply to a verification request. So when they got this, somebody leaked this document, which was is a proposal that... EcoHealth Alliance had submitted to DARPA, and they said, hey, DARPA, can you confirm that this is truly this proposal? They want to make sure that somebody wasn't making it up and just sending them a bunch of, bunch of BS. DARPA said, in accordance with U.S. federal acquisition regulations, we are not at liberty to divulge who may or may not have uh, submitted a proposal in response to any of the agency's solicitations. Further, <clears throat> information contained within bids is considered proprietary and can only be released by the bidder. That being said, <clears throat> I always love that that being said, that's like the but in a statement. DARPA has never funded directly nor indirectly as a subcontractor any activity or research or associated with the EcoHealth Alliance or the Wuhan Institute of Virology. However, we never played with those folks over there uh, for good reason, as you're about to find out. Since EcoHealth Alliance was not ultimately uh, selected to work on the DARPA preempt program, we recommend that you reach out to them for comment. Attached is the list of researchers who are on contract to support the program. So DARPA is being real clear. They're doing a carve out. EcoHealth, they're over there. They're not on our list. Uh, we never did fund them directly, indirectly, or the Wuhan Institute of Virology. We got nothing to do with any of that. <laughs> so they're just like, whoop, all done. Uh, so it's never official till it's denied. I love it. Um, so here's a part two of Drastic's opening statements. They say, in other words, a branch of the federal government had already judged aspects of EcoHealth Alliance's research and the corresponding shared research plan with the WIV is falling under the definition of gain of function only for HHS, this is under the NIH, to um, approve similar work without a P3CO review. Smoking gun. If you are a researcher and you say, hey, I want to, you know, I'm, I work for a big university. I want to I do some research on humans. That's cool, but you have to go through what's called an institutional review board, an IRB. They're going to take a look at what you propose. They're going to look at whether you have informed consent, what the risks are, what the potential benefits are. Is Do those balance out in the favor of benefits? Are you going to do anything unethical? Does this fit within a larger policy framework of what's allowed and what's not allowed? It's a very exhaustive process. And so what happened here that they're saying is that Equal Health Alliance tried to get this work funded through DARPA. And DARPA said, nope. And so then they ran it through and got it funded through the NIH. But... They skirted around the P3CO framework. And by the way, EcoHealth Alliance doesn't get to make that decision. They're not the ones who would have skirted that. They're just the people on the outside asking for federal money. Somebody inside has to skirt that um, and decide uh, that this application does not meet the gain-of-function standards. And I think we can all imagine who that would have to be, but that's a very high-level decision that has to be made. All right. In particular, the P3CO framework was designed to allow greater flexibility for vaccine development. And in June 2018, the NIH's Vaccine Research Center expanded its existing partnership with Moderna to include full-scale research into a pan-coronavirus vaccine platform. Well, wasn't that timely? In June of 2018, not only was the NIH now funding the kind of research that could have lead, led to an accidental pandemic release, but... They had a lot of forethought, and they were also funding um, aggressive research into the mRNA platform that Moderna was able to uh, produce in just two days after they received uh, uh, the, um, the coronavirus sequence uh, from China. Pretty, pretty amazing work there. EcoHealth Alliance uh, repeatedly took advantage of this flexibility to continue their work with the Wuhan Institute of Virology. This is truly explosive, folks. If this is true, that this work was going on, that... A, the NIH was funding research into creating new terrible versions of coronaviruses and funding research into how we would protect ourselves from those with vaccines. And then all of this escaped. I think we deserve to know that um, because that would be really important. So 
key 2020 moments in the lab leak uh, cover-up. January 31st, I uh, had this whole um, uh, update here, a presentation on how Fauci held an emergency meeting and all of his emails are actually redacted and we don't know what's in them. Congressmen are trying to find out. Senators are trying to find out what's in this bureaucrat's emails, but has not, have they have not been able to so far, um, as far as I know. But at any rate, he held this emergency meeting on January 31st. On February 4th, a natural origin paper uh, was, a draft was completed by Anderson et al. We went through that as well. That paper went into nature and it's been used as the sound debunking paper to prove that this virus must have come from nature. And on February 20th, The Lancet, um, there was a paper arranged by Peter Daszak and published, which called anybody who dared think of a lab leak uh, theory as a dangerous conspiracy theorist and that scientists were uniquely um, united in their views that this must have come from nature. Oops, this is all falling apart rather badly here today. Let's go into that. So let's talk about that media misinformation for a bit. Uh, February 2020, New York Times edition, they wrote Senator Tom Cotton repeats fringe theory of coronavirus origins. And they say this conspiracy theory that it came from a lab lacks evidence and has been dismissed by scientists. Hear that nice appeal to authority? It's been dismissed by scientists. All of them? What do you mean? That's like such an inclusive statement, right? It's been dismissed by scientists. Um, Well, are these uh, earth scientists, uh, biologists? Is it all of them? You sure? Because I knew scientists in February of 2020 who hadn't dismissed this theory yet. But they continue on here, quote, it has gained an audience with the help of well-connected critics of the Chinese government, such as Stephen Bannon, President Trump's former chief strategist. Um... I hate to point this out, but the New York Times at this moment in time in February of 2020 was still taking $100,000 a month from Chinese state media to run Chinese positive articles. I wonder if this is one of them. I don't know. I'd be interested to know if that's the case. But this is what New York Times is writing in February. By March, uh, CNN's writing, here's how to debunk coronavirus misinformation and conspiracy theories from friends and family. Such a helpful article. Um, thank you, Oliver Darcy Business. It's great when you have business writers telling you how to debunk conspiracy theories from friends and family. It's right in the wheelhouse. You can just feel it. It's such a, such a wonderful thing. But in some cases, relatives and friends share poor information, whether it's bad science related to how to prevent the virus, debunked rumors of, about cities being put on lockdown. <laughs> Imagine crazy, crazy <laughs> wackadoodle theories about cities going on lockdown. Or conspiracy theories about the origins of COVID-19. Thank you, CNN, for that. That's lovely. Uh, by April, NPR, uh, scientists debunk lab accident theory of pandemic emergence. That scientists. There's those scientists again. Scientists. Um, scientists dismiss the idea that the coronavirus pandemic was caused by, the accident, by an accident in lab. Uh, they believe the close interaction of people with wildlife was more likely. Uh, Again, so this is, uh, uh, thank you, Jeff Brumfield of NPR, heard on uh, No Things Considered, oh, All Things Considered. Um, this is just really, really, uh, they, and they don't correct this. They haven't corrected any of this, but this is what we were up against. So I showed you something from February, March, April. The, the media was just full of people debunking because scientists had all agreed that this thing must have come from nature. If they had bothered to do their job, they would have asked which scientists, and they would have discovered almost all of these scientists who are doing this debunking had direct conflicts of interest, either with the Wuhan Institute of Virology directly or indirectly through the NIH. But it was a big conflicted soup of virologists that were coming out with this. And so that was what they created. And by the way, just for fun, let's just go there. Um, uh, remember this uh, Lancet? Lancet is this uh, formerly... Uh, um, austere but now heavily disgraced journal that ran um, fraudulent studies uh, that they had to retract later. But the Lancet in December of 2020, this is, you're going to love this. This is awesome. Uh, they formed a commission. And this is a task force on the origins and early spread of COVID-19. On the origins, the Lancet says, we have to discover where this came from. So they put up a task force. Let's, oh, let's look at the task force. Who's the, oh, the president, uh, the, the chair of this whole thing, Peter Daszak. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, as well, oh, wait, what's this other one? Danielle Anderson, uh, scientific director. Uh, that's at the Duke Medical Center in Singapore. Hmm. Interesting. Where did I hear that before? Oh, uh, 
<laughs> Drastic has revealed the contents of these documents. They detail past achievements and planned experiments in collaboration with researchers from the WIV, including, oh, the Duke University in Singapore. Oh, think of the odds. They also at the Duke University of Singapore also ended up on the task force to investigate where this came from. Uh, pretty awesome. So uh, all of that leads me to say, I have an action photo here of the Lancet task force speeding to the scene. They're racing to find the origin. Here we can see them. Uh, they got a lot of police in, in support. So uh, awesome moment. Glad we captured that on film. So let's go there. Here's the bombshell. This is the absolute bombshell. Point number 16 from the drastic document. In this proposal, which is a very long proposal. I read the whole thing. I read all of Drastic's words. I read it twice just to make sure I knew exactly what was happening here. So the proposal includes the introduction of human-specific cleavage sites. I fought with virologists, Angie Rasmussen, uh, Stephen Goldman, uh, Anderson, uh, Christian Anderson. I fought with them all on Twitter and, and uh, some by email where they all said there's no chance that this that anything other than this protease cleavage site, the PRA cleavage site, came from anything other than it must have come from nature. But in 2018, we, we see here that the proposal said, we will analyze all SARS-CoV spike gene, gene sequences for appropriately conserved proteolytic cleavage sites in S2 and for the presence of potential furage cleavage sites where clear mismatches occur. We will introduce appropriate human-specific cleavage sites and evaluate growth potential in vero cells and in HAE cultures. This is in vitro, so they were taking viruses, coronaviruses, giving them this cleavage site, which enhances their pathogenicity, and then practicing with those in cell culture, in humanized or uh, simian cell cultures, to make sure that this enhanced the pathogenicity. Here it is, 2018, black and white, it happened. So what is this PRA furin cleavage site? So way back in May 2020, um, this, by the way, this is the, this is that paper that I told you about that came out here. Remember, there's this paper uh, that came out, uh, the draft was done on February 4th, comes out in Nature, the preeminent journal, and uh, it's called The Proximal Origin of SARS-CoV-2. And here we have all our cast of characters in here. We got this Christian Anderson person. We got Andrew Rambeau. We've got uh, Eddie Holmes here. We got Robert um, uh, Gary. These are all people who are in those Fauci emails. We know they are because we can see their names. We don't know what was discussed in those emails, but all of these people magically were there in Fauci's office urgently discussing how they were going to manage talking about this virus. And then, boop, this paper pops out. But in this paper, it's kind of cool. One thing I really appreciated was they showed this PRRA sequence that exists down here. It doesn't exist in any related, closely related coronaviruses. It's just this new sequence. And you can get mutations where a letter changes, right? An R becomes an A and S becomes a C or something, right? But get to get a whole new insert like this is a very, very different prospect, uh, naturally speaking. But in a lab, it's done all the time. In fact, this is a proteolytic cleavage site that the kind of which they were just talking about saying, hey, you know what we're going to do? We're going to just find some where, there, where mismatches occur. We'll introduce uh, appropriate human-specific cleavage sites. Um, by the way, this is a appropriate human-specific cleavage site that magically got inserted in the uh, human SARS-CoV-2 that doesn't exist in any of the related or closely related lineages of this thing. So to me, this was the clear smoking gun. There was a lot of hand-waving that there maybe it could have come about through natural means, but those are hard. Uh, this is an easy explanation, which is the people who said they were going to do it did it. That's an easy explanation. Harder is a bat got near a pangolin. There was a mutation. It was an insert. Had to go back into a bat. Somehow went to a human. That's hard. This is easy. Somebody put it there. Um, so that's the theory I've always had. Now, why is that important? Because having a, vi a virus has a really tough job. You have this immune system that's just dying to not have viruses get inside your cells because the virus outside your cell is not a problem. A virus inside a cell, that's a problem. Having this PRRA cleavage site here, which is, again, somebody said this to me on Twitter, probably the most boring use of the word cleavage you're ever going to have, but I'll use it. This cleavage site here, this, when it's there, it gets clipped and it causes the, the virus to undergo a change in its conformation and that allows it to fuse. So luckily somebody made a GIF of this. I'm going to show you what this looks like because it's really cool. That big blob on the top is a virus. Okay, and the big blob on the bottom is a cell. These are membranes. All these gray balls are membranes, and this shows 
the fusion process. So the virus is out there. It has those proteins. They get clipped. They fold in it. Because of that folding, it draws those two membranes together and makes them fuse. It forces the fusing. This is what viral membrane fusion looks like. Proteins are there. They get clipped and it pulls the two things together because otherwise those two membranes don't want to go together. They need to be forced. And that's what the proteolytic cleavage does. It causes a conformation of those two stalk-like green proteins. They get clipped, they fold, and it pulls them together. Now the virus is inside the cell. That's why the PRRA cleavage site is so important. That's why I focused on it right away. That's why I talked about it. That's why I said things like, uh, hey, journalists, you should really be looking at this thing right here, this PRRA um, polybasic furin cleavage site. It's unnatural and it's necessary. Well, unnatural. Uh, I'll talk to you about that in a second. Oh, by the way, uh, I, I actually interviewed uh, Angie Rasmussen here on the show. It was very polite to her. Um, uh, she became less polite to me over time because I kept asking questions, which were apparently not appreciated. Wrote this big piece in the Washington Post where they I, uh, rather unironically say democracy dies in darkness. Um, but they say here they, they printed this whole thing. And she wrote with uh, Stephen uh, Goldman, Goldstein, sorry, we may never know where the virus came from. Eh. But evidence still suggests nature. It's a big, long, convoluted, very poorly constructed argument. Um, but I just pulled out one piece of it where they wrote here, another key feature often cited as evidence of laboratory origin is the furin cleavage site, where the spike protein is cut in half to activate viral material for entry into cells, which we just saw how that works. The viruses most closely related to SARS-CoV-2 don't have this site, but many others do. That is not a scientific argument. Uh, you know what matters in science is the evolutionary, the genetics matter a lot. So if two things are very closely related, that's kind of like saying, well, I know humans don't have prehensile tails, but many other animals do. It's just it's not a good argument. It's like really weak. I couldn't believe they said it. It was like, huh. Um, the furin site of SARS-CoV-2 has odd features that no human would design. Its sequence is suboptimal, meaning its cleavage by the enzyme furin is relatively inefficient. Any skilled virologist hoping to give a virus new properties uh, this way would insert a furin site known to be more efficient. The SARS-CoV-2 site has more of the hallmarks of sloppy natural evolution than a human hand. The argument they're making here is, well, if we chose one, we probably wouldn't have done it that way. What they're leaving aside is the science of how virology is done, and these two virologists know this, which is one way is you tailor it and you design it and you engineer it and you put in exactly what you want. The second is you put in what you want, but then you start putting in through what's called serial passage where you put that virus and you put it into cell culture and you let it mutate and mutate and mutate. And then you take pieces of that sample out and you put it into animals and you pass it over and over and you let it mutate and mutate. So it's possible, as they should well know, that if you're monkeying around with these things in a lab, sometimes you get things that look like sloppy natural evolution because you've sped up the process of evolution in a lab. That is the, that's the cornerstone of virology research and has been for decades, and these two knew it. So this is um, really poor argumenting. That is when I see arguments formed this poorly, I know they're trying to hide something because they know better than this. I know that. Um, they, they obviously know better than that. So now we have to discuss another explosive part of this. It's the nature of something called a chimera. So we're talking about chimeric viruses. So what is a chimera? Hey, it's a mythical creature. It just really means uh, in, in uh, the chimera, according to Greek mythology, um, it's, you know, it's, it's a hybrid. Uh, it, has, it has a head of this and a body of that. It's just two different animals stuck together. So what's a chimeric virus? It's simply one where you've taken a section from one virus and you've welded it to another piece from another virus, or maybe even a third or a fourth. doesn't matter, but it's not the original virus. You've taken the backbone from one and the spike protein from another, and you put them together, and now it's what's called a chimera. So these chimeric viruses might be, consist of something like open reading frame one from virus one, open reading frame two from virus two, and then the spike protein from virus three. That's a chimeric virus. Uh, you're taking in what you're hopefully doing, hopefully, in gain of function research. Hey, we have a spike protein that's really dangerous, and it really binds the ACE2 receptor. Awesome. So we'll take that. And well, we got this backbone that's really stable, and it replicates really well, and we'll, we'll put these two things together. And we'll create that because what we want to do is we want to find out how these things work, right? So 
Uh, in point number 11 here, the proposal set clear pathways for chimeric virus construction. So they said here, synthesis of chimeric novel SARS viruses, we will commercially synthesize SARS-CoV-2-S glycoprotein genes. So they're going to make the gene itself. They're not even going to harvest it while they're just going to start making them, right? Designed for insertion into, and these are the various backbones from viruses. These are ones that they found in that cave that we just mentioned before. The SHC-014 or the WIV-16 molecular clone backbones, okay? These things have 88, 97% S protein identity to the original SARS classic, right? So they're, they're in there. They're, we're monkeying around now with things that are really close to the thing that caused the original SARS outbreak. Um, they're doing this in the BSL level three laboratories. Um, and they say here, uh, uh, these are BSL three, not select agents or subject to P3CL. They're like, no, no, we're just, we're just, we're just putting things together, but they're not subject to this gain of function stuff. They just claim that they don't explain why they don't say because, uh, it's been proven that these chimeras have no capability to infect humans. They just like, they just, declare, oh, they're really not subject to PC3. Uh, <laughs> it's just a claim. Um, they use bat SARS-CoV-2 backbones, which are exempt and are pathogenic to transgenic mice. Those That's human, HACE2, humanized ACE2 transgenic mice. They say they use bat SARS-CoV-2 backbones, SARS-CoV backbones, which are exempt and are path, they known to be pathogenic, known to be pathogenic to humanized mice. I don't know how they put those two statements together. These things don't qualify because they're pathogenic to humanized mice. Like that's exactly the definition of, of gain of function, by the way. However, we do not know what additional unpublished SARS-CoV-2 and mers cov research was conducted by the WIV. We don't know that. So we, you're supposed to publish everything, but maybe they didn't publish everything. So we don't know. Uh, Wuhan University, other Chinese institutions, indeed, using analyses of raw metagenomic data sets um, unpublished MERS COVE infectious clone research at Wuhan has recently been documented. So now we know that they weren't publishing everything. So when we say we don't know where this thing came from, not entirely true. We don't know what we don't know. In this case, we don't know what viruses the WIV and other Chinese institutions were working on. We don't know that. But we have clues that we know they were working on some stuff that they didn't publish. So there's that. All right. Um, remember, so... Uh, so this is one of the smoking gun emails. This is from my June 4th episode on uh, Fauci, uh, you know, trying to uh, hide the lab leak uh, thing story. He sent this out on Saturday, 1st of February, uh, pretty late at night. Important is the title. It's going to um, uh, Hugh Arkenclaus. He's uh, his uh, next in command under his uh, fiefdom there. And the attachments, Barrick, She et al., Nature Medicine, SARS, gain of function, dot PDF. Hugh, it is essential. We speak this morning. Keep your cell phone on. Like, this is a big emergency. It's important. Um, Tony. Okay. So what was, what was that paper that caused all that stir? Um, it's, it's this paper. And uh, Barrick, She, in 2015, there's a huge long paper. I'm just going to talk about this one part down here. Figure four is the smoking gun in this paper to me. Because uh, they say here, although our study does not invalidate the other emergence, emergence of viruses out of natural reservoirs, emergence routes, uh, it does argue for a third paradigm in which circulating bat coronavirus pools maintain poised spike proteins that are capable of infecting humans without mutation or adaptation. In green, this hypothesis is illustrated by the ability of a chimeric virus containing the SHC-014, there it is again, spike in a SARS-CoV backbone. So what did they just do? They took SARS classic, which they know infects humans, and they welded it to a spike protein from one of these viruses they found, presumably from that mine in China where some miners got sick and died from a SARS-like illness. So they took, they're monkeying around, they're putting backbones and spikes together in these chimeras. So they say, um, again, in green, quote, this hypothesis is illustrated by the ability of a chimeric virus containing the SHC-14 spike in a SARS-CoV backbone to cause robust infection in both human airway cultures and in mice without receptor binding domain adaptation. Repeat, 
in both human airway cultures. They're actually taking air from uh, people who've gone through surgery, lungs get removed, they take the tissue from that, they grow it in a lab because that's the human airway, and they can show that this Chimera virus that they made in 2015 where they took this plus this and stapled it together can infect the human airway tissue. Well, now, why was this important to Fauci? Well, that's easy because in 2015, when this paper was put out, we were under a full gain of function research ban in the United States. Does this sound a little like gain of function research? Taking two separate parts of known human pathogens and putting together and demonstrating robust infection in human airway cultures? Sounds a little like it to me, but that's how I read it. Uh, Continuing on, in white, coupled with the observation of previously identified pathogenic coronavirus backbones, our results suggest that the starting materials required for SARS-like emergent strains are currently circulating in animal reservoirs. So the pieces are out there. The pieces. Wouldn't it be, you know, instead of, and I, here's maybe the, the nicest way to look at this. They're saying instead of waiting for those pieces to accidentally come together and surprise us, why don't we put them together and then we'll know what we're dealing with, All right? In yellow, continuing, quote, notably, although full-length SHC14 coronavirus probably requires additional backbone adaptation to mediate human disease. And that's what they did. That's 2015, this paper. In 2018, three full, long, investigative years later, they're monkeying around with this exact combination of this spike protein, this backbone, these different strains, putting them all together, putting in furin cleavage sites, putting all of this into humanized um, mouse models, putting them into human airway epithelial cells, putting them into cell cultures, putting them into animal models, just playing around with this stuff. And then, oops, something looks like it probably happened. All right. Um, so, so I love this. You know, let me just go back to this real quick. This whole virology community circling the wagons, you know, to try and, um, I, I presume, protect their, their budgets and jobs, which is to- I totally get it. But Washington Post should understand that when you're running articles like this. You need to disclose those conflicts, but that's a different story. Again, in yellow, the virus is most closely related to SARS-CoV-2. They don't have this site, but many others do. <laughs> Let me just show you this. Again, this is from my May 4th, uh, 2020 update. Um, here's SARS-CoV-2 way over here. And these are all of, uh, 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 coronaviruses in a big wheel. And this is, this is a family lineage tree. So let me get a slightly different drawing tool out. So what happens is, um, to go from here to here, nothing has changed, but to go from here to this next little step over, um, that shows uh, an evolutionary step or change, a, a very serious, um, mutation or insertion or deletion or something has happened to make this little virus here, totally different from that one there. They're totally different strains. In fact, they may infect completely different species um, and have completely different activity. So every step is really, really important on this. It's a family tree. So it's kind of like I'm very closely related to brothers and sisters, very closely related to mom and dad. I'm a lot less closely related to cousins five times removed, right? Because that's what a family tree does. So each one of these is like a family uh, tree generation. It's not quite as clean as that, but it's for our purposes fine. But here's SARS-CoV-2. Nobody here has um, a, a furin cleavage site. Nobody here has a furin cleavage site. So it doesn't have any close relatives. You have to go back step after step after step after step, 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 step step to get to a, a something that's sort of uh, related. And then, um, you know, then the theory is, I guess, somehow these two things sort of just mix and match, right? All right. Uh, to me, that's not terribly believable. Um, it's, uh, it's a little bit, you know what this reminded me of when they, when they said uh, this part right here, uh, the virus is most closely where it's SARS-CoV-2. They don't have this site, but many others do. Um, it reminded me of this scene in, in uh, the birth of Earl Jr. in, in My Name is Earl. <laughs> there he is with his, his loving wife. And I think this is the first moment that Earl uh, Sr. sort of gets the get, gets a clue that maybe uh, something genetically happened that just really wasn't all that logical and probably they wouldn't have a good explanation for. So uh, that's what I see there. So how do we look at this? Um, there's a lot more in this uh, drastic document. It's really astonishing. Uh, I, I've got tons more I could tell you about it. I'm going to have to move this down a little bit to get this... Uh, Yeah, I can sort of see that. Um, So here's my conclusion here. Uh, By 2018, aggressive efforts were underway to build 
on the 2015 Barrick Xi success in creating human pathogenic chimeric SARS viruses. Those are the ones that uh, Fauci said, important, you know, we got to get on this right away. By 2018, Fauci's NIH, they had contracted with Moderna to create mRNA vaccines capable of treating a COVID-like pathogen. Also in 2018, DARPA rejected an outrageous $14 million proposal from EcoHealth because it, whoop, I didn't finish it. Let me finish your sentence for you right there. Um, because it um, violated gain of function rules. Uh, they didn't say it quite that directly, but um, that's my interpretation of it. Uh, and then uh, the NIH under Fauci then funded it. Um, after completely skirting institutional review processes for such proposals because, well, we don't know why. Um, Nobody's had to answer for that, and all the emails are redacted, so we don't know. And now, your entire way of life has been turned upside down. My conclusion for today is it didn't have to be this way. Uh, corollary, this virus was a self-inflicted wound. We should not have been monkeying around with gain-of-function research. We should be having a full-throated conversation about that. The people who skirted laws, the people who maybe even broke laws, the people who were most directly responsible for unleashing this inadvertently, I hope, they need to be held to account for that. Not made richer, not allowed to keep their jobs or retire quietly. They need to be held to account for this or it'll happen again. That's why we have to, this isn't about retribution. This is about saying consequences and full light needs to be shown on this because what happened was really very, very inappropriate. All right. So what do you do with this? Uh, I'll tell you what, tilt all your actions towards regeneration, plant your gardens. Um, I do think that things are going to get a lot hinkier in the story before they get better. I think that um, this level of um, when it spills over, that these sorts of things have been happening and that these were self-inflicted wounds. And given the social mood right now, I think the chance, plus all the shortages we're starting to see and the fact the Federal Reserve's printing, when we put all this together, I think it's a, a, an environment which could very easily result in some pretty significant economic dislocations, disruptions, maybe societal disruptions. We're getting really close to that. That's why I'm going to be talking about that in part two of this um, over at my website. By the way, if you like this video, if you learned something from it, hey, remember to subscribe and in many cases resubscribe because for whatever reason, people helpfully get unsubscribed from this channel all the time. And if you want to, please, please, please uh, share this video with five friends. This story needs to get around this. I, listen, it's being totally ignored in the mainstream press right now, but it shouldn't be this story about this particular proposal that EcoHealth Alliance put into DARPA is enormous news, groundbreaking. I predict you'll be reading about it in four or five months from places that will pretend they discovered this story uh, back then. At any rate, follow me at these places here. And if you want to see part two of this, come on by peakprosperity.com. I got a lot more I'm going to cover in this. I'm going to be a lot more direct about some things that I'm seeing out there in the world. That's at my website. It's at Peak Prosperity. We have a special offer here for any of you Livio, full frame. Great. Um, we have a full uh, offer here for anybody from YouTube where you can try this out. It's uh, here in this card link. You've probably seen the card elsewhere in this presentation and as well down there below in the description, of course. And I'll put all the links down there. Read this report for yourself and think about what it really means. The implications are extraordinary. We'll be talking about this more at Peak Prosperity. Come on by. See you there. Uh, good luck, everyone. We'll see you next time.